All right, all right, all right. Hopefully, you guys are all coming back online. Let's double check here and make sure that it's working. Okay, welcome back, everyone. We're going to give everyone an opportunity to uh, join us again. I'm sorry for the complications earlier on, but don't worry. We'll get you all caught up to speed here in a second. All right, here we go. Much, much better. It looks like it's actually streaming fantastically. Is the audio good? Everyone can hear me? Everyone can see me? Perfect. Okay. Well, then welcome back. I'll do a brief recap. Uh, today is the City of Tacoma-sponsored tour of Historic Fern Hill, Washington State's, one of Washington's oldest um, settled neighborhoods, uh, certainly one of the oldest for Tacoma, and just by far one of my absolute favorite ones to tour. So as you guys are all trickling back in, we should be good to go. Okay. All right. All right. All right. Now we just need to make sure that everything is going to work. Okay. And it looks like it should be fine. So tonight is going to be pretty exciting. Most of the tour we're actually going to be able to do um, virtually. You know, normally I like to do a lot of narrative and then sort of intersperse it with some historic photos. We do get to do that, but I actually was able to go out uh, now that the world is opening back up and uh, do a lot of video fly through of everything that was going on down there. So you should be able to get to see uh, a vast majority of Fern Hill tonight as well. So what I'm going to do right now is I'm actually going to open it up and take you guys um, into Fern Hill itself. Now, I was saying that the entire history of this neighborhood owes its existence uh, to a bird, a cow, and a cougar. Uh, and I'm going to justify that now in its entirety. The development of the shoemaking machine that allowed uh, cattle to become a hot commodity outside of just food really developed the area. Uh, people came out to settle it. Uh, Soolitz, who later became known as Indian Henry, really helped people navigate those first uh, paths out there. And thus the area was established uh, and turned into a functional neighborhood. And it was the Bird family, BYRD, who is the most famous for bringing life to the area out there. Adam Bird uh, was the first of the Bird lineage to go and settle the area. Uh, when he got out there, he spent a year there before he died and then uh, the family empire went on to uh, his firstborn son, Andrew. Uh, but Andrew developed mostly the Stilicum area where he built a grist mill and a lumber mill by damming the creek at the um, end of Stilicum Lake, which at the time they called Bird Lake. And he really was influential in bringing people to the area, but it was the youngest of the bird children, George, who was the first to settle what is now the Fern Hill neighborhood. And he built his homestead out there and raised his children out there and really drew people to the very specific area that's now Fern Hill. And what's interesting about that is that it's the cougar that made them sink their roots in deeper because at the time, George's children had to walk three miles to one of the only schools in the area. Uh, and two of his daughters, who were very little at the time, were walking to school for that three mile, and they just had like a weird feeling. And the entire time they were walking, they felt really nervous. And as they were getting close to the schoolhouse, uh, a cougar came out onto the path in front of them. Uh, and later they found out that it had been stalking them for that entire journey. And so from then on, George was like, no more. You guys aren't walking through the woods. We're building a school right here. And the school was multi, multi-duty. Not only did it operate as the schoolhouse for all of the children in the area, but it served as the church, the community center, and the courthouse. So when the birds got scared by the cougar, they established that area. So there you go, a cow, a bird, and a cougar. Nuts. Uh, to really remind you of that, they actually have underneath the main awning of the public library there, they have a mural 
um, which I'm going to share with you guys here really quick, uh, that shows basically everything of importance in the story of Fern Hill. So when you're looking at it here, uh, this is the development of agriculture and farmland out there. Uh, the, this is a historic photo of one of the first classes at that first schoolhouse, uh, which was designed to be 22 feet by 22 feet, and that had 22 students in attendance for the first year. This is the development of Fern Hill with a streetcar and trestle bridge, which we'll get to here in a second. Uh, and then as we move across my absolute favorite part of the mural, uh, there's, there's the birds up there and there's the bird children terrified of what is quite honestly the scariest illustration of a cougar I've ever seen. So it really gives you the urgency of why they wanted to build that schoolhouse. Uh, so there you go, a, a pictorial history of Fern Hill to sort of give you a flavor for everything that we're gonna talk about. Uh, the importance of 84th Street is not given away by the name of the street at all. Uh, what is now 84th is actually Washington Road number one. Uh, when the area was first established in the 1860s, um, well, 1850s really, they were like, okay, it's great having this trail that goes from Mount Rainier to Commencement Bay, but we need to actually get moving around. Uh, so three guys were hired uh, to go and make a road and they made this long road. They labored for approximately a year, uh, sort of clearing a path, chopping down trees, clearing it all out. And in that time that they were gone, uh, it got the area got separated into separate counties, uh, Pierce, Kitsap, so on. And so when they came back and presented the bill for their work, all the counties like pass the buck to someone else. They're like, oh, actually, I think Pierce agreed for this. And Kitsap was like, no, 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 no. We, we, uh, and so they never got paid for the project. But now there was this narrow but functional road that connected everything. And that became Washington's first road. Uh, eventually, after the establishment of Fort Stillicum, uh, they deployed all the soldiers to widen it out, grade it, and to make it even more functional. And that became Military Road uh, after Washington Road Number 1. And then eventually, after things changed hands over and over again, it is now 84th Street, uh, which really doesn't do justice to the historic importance of that first road in Washington State. But there it is. Uh, and the area where 84th and Park intersect is the heart of Fern Hill and the beginning of the whole area down there. So if you guys have any questions about that, just ask me and I'm happy to elaborate. But what I want to do now is actually take you virtually down to that corner um, so that you can get to see uh, the area for yourself and, and I'll talk you through it as we go. So here we go. So this, um, what is Hoarder's Attic, is directly across the street from the old Masonic Lodge, uh, 8243. It's now Grace Community Church, uh, but that was a Masonic Lodge built in 1922. But the site of it is actually the first church in Fern Hill. And we'll, we'll go see that here in a second. What I think is so amazing about Fern Hill, what endears it to my heart so much as a neighborhood, is that every time Fern Hill has encountered any sort of, uh, I don't know, authority or problem, they have fought so aggressively against it. Uh, and they basically have always gotten their way. Anytime someone tries to make Fern Hill do something, they're like, no. Uh, and they resist and change it. Uh, across the corner here is one of my favorite parts of Fern Hill, the Rooster Good Luck Gate. Uh, this was established uh, for Lunar New Year on the year of the rooster uh, by a local Buddhist temple. And if you pass through the gate, you're supposed to get good fortune. So very few people know that it's down there. Uh, very few people know that if you take your gimbal camera through it, the chains will knock it right off its axis. But now you have been 
educated to both of those facts. Uh, a lot of these homes in Fern Hill, uh, you can see go through various degrees of historic. Uh, this one that we're passing on the right here uh, is of that original collection of homesteaders out there. Uh, and you can see how narrow and tall they used to be. But we are walking down to the Fernhill Elementary School, which is such a passionate part of the community for people. Because that first school was built out there in 1888 um, in that square format, uh, it was the main civic center for the area. And it's actually where the name Fernhill came from. Uh, when they had the first sort of community event out there, they're like, what are we going to call this neighborhood of ours? Uh, and it said that the community leader at the time was looking out the window and he's like, hmm, well, we're on a hill covered with ferns. Why don't we call this Fern Hill? And sure enough, they did. Now, you may have noticed when we were looking at that school that it looks particularly more modern than you might expect a 21 foot by 21 foot school to be. And that is because as the community grew, the school quickly became too small for the amount of students that they needed there. And so they moved that building away uh, and built a larger schoolhouse. And then they had to get rid of that schoolhouse and construct an even larger one. So the one that we're looking at now is from the 1920s. Uh, that brick schoolhouse that exists currently in Fern Hill is the 1920s rendition of Fern Hill Elementary. And it is in a lot of ways exactly the way that it would have been in the 1920s. Some interesting things about that is that when they were going to move the George Bird home uh, so that they could build the larger school there, they tried to demolish it, but it had built, been built so sturdy that they couldn't. They couldn't knock it over no matter how hard they tried. So they burned it to the ground uh, and then built the school as we have it today. Now, in a second, you're going to get to see the entirety of the school as we fly through here. And one of the cool things about it is that it still has the original bell on top. And the bell, I believe, is 800 pounds. Here, we'll... Oh, sorry. This is the the corner again. I want to, da, 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 here we go. So as we fly through, you get to see um, all of the school here. I'll give you an opportunity to see it in its, its full glory here. So the bell is an 800 pound bell and they sold it when they built the new school to a Methodist church in the area for $50. And once the school district did that, Fern Hill was like, are you kidding me? Absolutely not. We won't stand for it. And so I'm not saying that they rebelled, but they definitely threw a big fuss about it. And they ended up getting the bell back and it's been reinstalled on top of the school ever since. Uh, the plinth here commemorates all the great things about Fern Hill. Uh, the first schoolhouse being erected there in 1880. Uh, the Military Road or Washington Road number one is what is now 84th Street. And the first telegraph line in the area ran along that street. It's also um, important to the Pierce County Pioneer and Historical Association. There's a lot of good stuff that is all originated in this area. <laughs> this gets, there it is. Thank you. I love me a good pun. Um, the bell, however, isn't the first time that Fern Hill really took a stand against uh, something they didn't like happening. Uh, Fern Hill was an independent neighborhood uh, from the 1880s until it was incorporated in Tacoma into in 1909. And when Tacoma sort of took it over, Fern Hill had a bunch of pushback. They didn't like that at all. They wanted to be their own town. Uh, but they didn't have the infrastructure or anything to really uh, support that. So they end up becoming part of Tacoma. Okay, right here, really quick. This is the original bell in a brand new bell tower uh, that's been reinstalled up on the top here. So next time you're down in Fern Hill, you can see that bell that they reclaimed, which I really love. 
when Fernhill gets incorporated into Tacoma in 1909, um, they are connected to the city of Tacoma by a streetcar. Let's see if I can bring that up for you guys here really quick. Um, bum, bum, bum. Let's see. So we've got some sweet. So here's uh, the original Fernhill streetcar. It went down um, primarily what is Yakima Street today, uh, but it did eventually go down 84th. So it ran you know, right in front of uh, the church that used to be the Masonic Lodge, Hoarder's Attic, all of that. Here we go. And I love this one because it gives you a really good sense that it wasn't just a streetcar used to move pedestrians from uh, Fern Hill all the way up to Tacoma. But they also used it as a lumber train, um, mostly on Sundays when pedestrian traffic was lighter. Uh, they would use it to move lumber from the vast forest and sawmills down there up into Tacoma where they would ship it out from Commencement Bay. <laughs> then uh, the city of Tacoma did some sneakiness where they were like, okay, from Tacoma to 64th, the fare is going to be a nickel. But from 64th down to Fern Hill on 84th, that's going to be an additional dime. And so you can imagine how Fernhill felt about that. They're like, are you kidding us? No way. And so as they always do, uh, Fernhill wasn't having it. And so they staged a sit-in on the trolley. Uh, they took over the entire thing and refused to leave to the point where the driver had to just pull it over onto a spur line and they couldn't use that one anymore. Eventually uh, there was a fair change to make things more fair. And uh, Fernhill got their way once again. My, uh, my favorite part of that story though, is that the newspaper boys in Fernhill were like, oh shoot, here's a sweet opportunity to make some money. Uh, and so they went and sold newspapers to everyone on the Fernhill trolley the next morning. They're like, here's a whole crowd of people that aren't going anywhere and probably wanna know what's going on. Genius, genius enterprising Fernhill, well done. Um, we're gonna go up the corner here. I'll see if I can take you guys from the school. If you go just up the hill, you head east, uh, you get to a collection of churches and we get to see them here. We did the, the walkthrough with them. I'm going to bring up that video. If you can be patient with me for just a moment here. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Here we go. So the just one block away, we went up the hill, and now you can see the churches. Uh, this particular one right here is a, an old Baptist church. You kind of get a sense for the shape of it. They've done an addition to it. Uh, but as you're looking at it right here, you can kind of see the edge of it there. That would be Fernhill Baptist. Uh, from 1890, it still operates, last I heard, as a church, although I think it's undergoing some changes right now. Uh, but that was built in 1890, but it wasn't the first church in the area. Uh, and this is important because this one was built right here. The first church was Fernhill Methodist, built in 1889, just one year sooner than that. And it was mostly bankrolled by George Bird, our boy, uh, who really believed in the area and had all the money to burn. And he established the Methodist church out there and they were all about making it deluxe. So it had a bell tower uh, that was the tallest in the area by far, uh, well over 25 feet, I believe was the official count. And it was right on the corner of 84th and Park or at the time what was Park Street and uh, Washington Road number one. But because Tacoma's rail car went through all the time on Sundays carrying the logs, it was too noisy that people couldn't hear the sermon. And so Fern Hill, as they do, were like, nope, we won't stand for this. So they picked up the church and they moved it. Uh, they put the entire building up and they transferred it here 
to what you're looking at right now. So I believe it was three blocks that they had to move it by hand. And this is the Methodist church as it is today. Uh, it's currently Good Samaritan. Uh, and what's interesting here is if you look at the exterior, you'll, you'll notice that that's a very stubby bell tower. I don't want to judge uh, anybody's church, uh, but it's not the, the grand bell tower that I may have promised you in earlier, earlier renditions of this. I'm trying to bring up. Here we go. We'll put you on pause here for a second with this one. I want to show you a historic photo of the church as it used to look so that you can see the grandeur of that bell tower. Obviously, it was much, much larger when it was established in 1889. And what ends up happening is the bell that they ordered never arrived. Uh, and so the Fernhill community got together and they're like, man, what are we going to do? This bell hasn't arrived. It's kind of an embarrassment. And so they're like, well, let's just rip that bell tower down. And thus they did. Uh, they just scooped the bell tower off the building uh, so that it wasn't just there without any bell. And so this is the building as we see it today. And you can see where they took out the stained glass window uh, and scooped off the top of the bell tower there. And they're like, you know what? No big deal. And yeah, they absolutely did. I mean, Really, that wasn't that big of a feat at the time. They had just moved an entire church three blocks without disassembling it. Taking the bell tower off was child's play at that point. They're like, whatever. Oh, boy. I'm not going to say much more about that. I'm going to take you guys back downtown, though, because there are some very cool parts on the main drag, and you see the majority of Fern Hill on park. Uh, so let's see if I can bring that up for you guys here really quick. Um, boop, 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 boop. And then I'll give you some more of the good old historic photos of Fern Hill, which I know you guys are all into. Here we go. So let's take you to this one really quick. And um, you can see one of my favorite parts of Park Street here. So this is just a cool corner by itself. I'm going to go across the street here and check that place out in a second. But the... Fernhill Bookstore is right here, and you can kind of glimpse it through the window as we're walking past. It's a labyrinth of books, and you have to ask at the counter where to find anything. But they have just the craziest collection of stuff in there. What we're here to look at right now, though, is this building what is currently the harper law offices uh this was originally built in 1890 as a wells fargo stop afterwards it was for a brief period of time a shoe store but i think most notably it was an ice cream joint called andy's place and andy nelson was a tacoma baseball legend he was a right-handed pitcher and it said that he had a million dollar arm and after his retirement from professional baseball, he ended up setting up uh, an ice cream shop here in his home neighborhood. Okay. Sounds like the audio went off there a little bit. But um, I'll take you guys and Andy back into this really quick here. So this, um, do, 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 do. I'll see if I can go back to it here really quick. So you got to see the, the bookshop really quick there. This little unassuming place right here. Uh, is one of the oldest structures in there that was the Wells Fargo stop. Uh, so the messenger ponies would actually come here. And for the most part, it's the original structure. They've done new facing to it. Um, but it is, it is the building that you would have encountered way back when. What's interesting about that is how many different things it's gone through. Like I see someone... Uh, already mentioned the fact that the the bookstore there used to be a lawnmower shop. Uh, and yeah, a lot of the businesses in Fern Hill, because they've been around forever, have undergone many changes. The most notable one for that Wells Fargo stop uh, before becoming a law office, before becoming a shoe store, I believe, for a long period of time. Uh, it was a place called Andy's Place. Uh, and Andy Nelson was um, a professional baseball player who was born and raised in Fern Hill. 
Um, after his retirement from professional baseball, he came back and he set up an ice cream shop and card parlor and uh, operated there for quite a long period of time. And a lot of people from the area had really fond memories of him that we poured through in different historic documents. So he was definitely one of the highlights of the area. Uh, the other place that gets the most mention is down on the corner. And I'm going to see if I can bring up the the historic photo of that one really quick. Da, 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 da. It was a grocery store. So what is now um, Hoarder's Attic used to be a, um, a grocery store for a period of time there. And after that, it was also a, a pinball. I'm not even sure what the word is for it. Someone's going to have to tell me here. Not a pinball arena. A pinball arcade and more than that this is in the time too like 1930s where pinball wasn't just like a retro game that you went to play it was a form of gambling uh and so it was subject to several pinball busts which in the context of 2020 sounds absolutely absurd i know but trust me there was a time where pinball was the nefarious game of low lives and dealers <laughs> And uh, for a long, long part of history, there was a place that had pinball down in Fern Hill. Obviously, times have changed. There's no uh, pinball dens down in Fern Hill that I know of anymore, unless they're deep, deep underground. But uh, this is a good point to talk about the, the prominent grocer scene in Fern Hill. Uh, because there was such a, a rich and tight-knit community down there, the the grocer game was strong. And so um, several of the most important members of Fern Hill were grocers, uh, butchers, and produce marketers. Uh, and so there is another mural in the area here. Let's see if I can spin you around to that one that really sort of highlights the importance of that. Here we go. So you get to see with this mural, which you may have noticed Fernhill is big on, uh, sort of the history of grocers in the area. Coblins, I think, is the most notable name of grocers in the area. He's one of the first ones out there uh, and really sort of run the, ran the block, if you know what I mean. Um, we're gonna actually take you down now to the corner. You got to see the Masonic Lodge but I want to take you down to see the International Order of Oddfellows Lodge, which, if I can bring it up here, is pretty, pretty sweet. Thank you guys for your patience with this. I had this all loaded up in a very smooth deck. It had flashy transitions and everyone was going to be very impressed. And then technology failed me, as only technology truly can. So here we go. Uh, that's that main corner again. That's Park uh, and 84th. As we go past uh, the corner down here, you get to see sort of the main commercial section. Right on my right is Tibbetts. Um, Tibbetts at Fern Hill is a very classy restaurant down there, but I don't want to sell short Little Jerry's. Uh, Little Jerry's, as you may have seen, it does breakfast and burgers. They're a Seinfeld-themed diner run by another former PLU graduate. Uh, and it's, uh, it's good stuff. Very few places in the world have Seinfeld-themed diners. So congratulations, Fernhill. You have made the list. Yeah, Little Jerry's is what's up. It's, it's really good stuff. So as we, we cruise down here, uh, we get to pass some sweet buildings, but it's this bad boy that I really want to show you. Uh, so this was the International Order of Oddfellows. Uh, this was built, oh man, I'm trying to remember the year on this one here. Uh, oh, 1891. Thankfully, they put it right on this roof there. So anytime a historian forgets it, you can see. Uh, 1891, this was an Oddfellows Lodge and they used the bottom level for retail. Uh, so it was a grocer with a butcher in the back corner. Uh, and then they've changed hands so much over time, but in the 1980s, it was a private residence and they found on the upper floor an old safe 
from the time when it was an odd fellows lodge and they couldn't unlock it. And they're like, well, let's get rid of it. So they shoved it out the balcony and this is it in the background there. Uh, it was so heavy after they rolled it out of the building that they couldn't move it. So they just left it in the backyard there where it has been for what, 40 years now, all the way out that balcony down to the bottom. Uh, apparently it was just too expensive to get any sort of safe Smith or locksmith out there to try and open it. So they're like, let's get rid of this sucker. Uh, clearly they made the safe choice. Oh, so brutal. I'm so sorry. Um, what's doubly cool about this building is that um, in between its period as a private um, single family home and a grocer, it operated as a guild hall for loot makers. Now, if you're wondering to yourself, what? <laughs> yes, uh, the stringed instrument, the loot, not a graduate from PLU, uh, is something that was made emphatically in the Tacoma area for a period of time. And so in, I believe the 1960s and 70s, the Guild Hall of Loot Makers operated out of what was once the Oddfellows Lodge there in Fern Hill. And even if you go to the Google map, uh, it still has, oh man, I forget the word for loot maker, but it still has like the Guild Hall of the insert word for loot maker here. Uh, and I love that that little bit of history made it onto Google Maps. One of the things that made Fern Hill so difficult to access is that, um, as the name suggests, they were on a very steep hill. And so dividing Fern Hill from downtown Tacoma was actually a very aggressive gully or gulch. And they had to build a trestle bridge over it, which you may have noticed in the uh, scary cougar mural. And so that trestle bridge connected the area for a long period of time until eventually they put a, a culvert in there uh, and then filled in the top and then paved over it. So as you're going down both Park and Yakima, you're actually going over that gulch today. Uh, and when we were doing research for the Fern Hill area, apparently it was the thing as a Fern Hill youth to go and see if you could dare yourself to walk all the way through the storm drain to the other side. So we have some footage here that will allow you to not only see uh, the gulch, but sort of what the Fernhill area would have looked like before it was really developed. Uh, before you even ask, no, I did not go through the storm drain because it is significantly smaller than it used to be. Uh, and so it's not quite the same experience. It would have been a lot more crawling through sewage uh, and a lot less walking through storm drain, I believe. Um, and while that sounds like a blast, weirdly enough, it didn't make my list of stuff to do on a weekday. Uh, let's see if I can figure out, here we go. Uh, so here you get to see that sort of green belt uh, and the area that once would have been the trestle bridge. So we'll, so this is just a few feet down from the Odd Fellows Lodge where we just were. And that's, it's funny you bring that up, Faye. I have a great story about chicken here in a second. Um, and as we come up here, you're like, oh, this doesn't seem that imposing. Someone probably just forgot to trim their hedges. But in fact, it's a very steep gulch. And so this is what the Fernhill area really would have looked like before it was developed. And I love it because it gives you such a sense for why it was difficult for people to get around, why the need for Washington Road number one came about, uh, why the development of the streetcar and then holding people hostage for that extra dime was so important because it wasn't like you were just like, oh, I'll just get out on Yakima and drive in. Um, you really had to traverse some some tricky landscape. And as you can see, it's it's pretty expansive. It goes for several hundred feet across here. And this is even after it's been toned down. And it goes uh, quite a ways. It eventually 
levels out and you can do a little less uh, navigation of topography there, but it is, um, it's a pretty cool area down there. On the other side, which we're about to go to here, it's not as steep, uh, but it's significantly more marshy. And that marsh is actually one of the parts that was so important to the development of Fern Hill, uh, because when people first started coming out there and building homes, they found that it was mostly peat bogs out there. Uh, and that if they drained the peat bogs about 10 feet down, there would be this really rich, fertile soil. And that is where people started the hop industry. So the bird family were uh, second to the game. They followed in the footsteps of the Meekers. Uh, you're probably already familiar with Jacob and Ezra. Jacob uh, was the the genesis of the hop revolution in the Washington area, and Ezra was the hop king. He made it super, super profitable and famous in the area. And the Meekers and the birds did not get along. Uh, they were competitors in the hop industry. They were competitors for um, dams and grist and sawmills. And their whole family drama sort of culminated with tragedy in, uh, this is complicated, but I'm gonna try and make it as simple as possible. Um, Andrew, you may remember the first born son of Adam Bird. Um, and Andrew was the most beloved bird in the area, um, more than Turkey on Thanksgiving. Uh, the community really looked up to him. He was very, uh, just very well respected in the area. And um, Ezra Meeker were always at odds with each other. And the guy who got in the middle of this whole thing was a guy named J.M. Bates and his cow. Now, what happens is Bates was simple. He was uh, touched. And so one day, the only thing that he really cared about in his whole life was this cow. He had his prized cow and the cow went missing. She wandered off somewhere. And the story goes that Ezra um, sort of put it in Bates' mind that maybe Andrew Bird had stolen the cow. So this guy who's a little mentally slow um, goes and confronts Andrew Bird about the theft of the cow. And Andrew's like, I don't have your cow. You're welcome to come into the barn and take a look, but I didn't steal it. But Bates doesn't believe him. So he waits at the Stillicum post office for three days until Andrew Bird shows up to collect mail. And then Bates shoots him three times. And unfortunately, one of the shots pierces his bladder and he very slowly dies um, uh, as he's trying to convalesce nearby. The townspeople were so enraged by this that they actually went to the local jailhouse where Bates was being held, tore the cell door off the building, uh, and then took him and hanged him in a local barn. Uh, and their anger wasn't even quelled at that point. So they told Ezra that he needed to skip town because they blamed him for this entire incident. So Ezra Meeker actually lived for about a year in exile in Oregon before coming back and starting the Hop Empire all over again. Uh, and it's it's a super uh, like emotionally jarring story and it kind of takes place in between Fern Hill and Stillicum, but it really rocked uh, the community because Andrew Bates or I'm sorry, Andrew Bird was such a pillar to the area and his death really sort of propelled George Bird, the youngest of the Bird clan into establishing the area and really digging in and turning Fern Hill into the area. So again, when we're telling the story of a cow, a bird and a cougar, there's just so much that hinges on those three creatures, honestly. Um, while we're talking about bird, I want to take you guys quickly over. Uh, the public library doesn't just have a really fantastic mural uh, depicting the sort of whole history of the area, but they have one of the original um, grist millstones from the bird enterprise um, displayed right out front there. Uh, and they're using that area as well as a memorial to all of the um, 
boys from Fern Hill who ended up dying overseas. Uh, so yeah, this is, I'm pretty sure it's one of the original 1857 um, millstones that they used to grind down uh, corn uh, into a meal. This is a very good question. Uh, the cow is left out of the history altogether. Apparently uh, she had just wandered off. They did find her later, but nobody knows who she went to or what happened. So um, this is the, the World War II memorial um, to all of these soldiers who were from the Fern Hill area who ended up dying overseas. Uh, so the, the Fern Hill Library, which the, that area was also a gift from George Bird, ends up being a really pivotal area even now to the Fern Hill community. And so many of these little uh, historic treasures are focused right in the area. In fact, immediately across the street, if I can bring it up for you, they have a, um, a park that has... Uh, a wagon wheel, uh, because the wagon wheel is the official symbol of Fern Hill, being that it is on Washington Road number one. Uh, it has an old, a vintage looking, but not vintage, uh, streetcar clock as a commemorative moment to the fact that that streetcar was the first one to connect Tacoma to really the greater area out there. Uh, and uh, some sort of plaques in there about everything going on in the area. So here's the park. I'll adjust the, the volume for you here really quick so it's not all that traffic noise. Uh, and again, a lot of people don't even know that Fern Hill exists, let alone the fact that it has so many of these cool historic treasures right there in the area. So there's the the artistic wagon wheel. Uh, and then right up the corner here, just around to the right, is that street clock for the streetcar that used to come down into the area. Okay, here's the commemorative plaque for Washington Road number one. So cool. Um, also, just across the street from there is a stone. Uh, we talked briefly about uh, Soholitz or Indian Henry, who really, I mean, should get full credit for the establishment of the area because he's the one who helped people navigate that first trail um, from Mount Rainier to Commencement Bay. Uh, he's the one who was like, hey, you guys are going to want to settle in this area. Uh, the land is good uh, and it can be developed for whatever you need. Uh, so this is his commemorative stone. Unfortunately, uh, it's faded a little bit there, but it's got the, the wagon wheel. Uh, and then um, I think they were trying to do a symbol for the Nisqually tribe. And again, there's no, no one really knows uh, which nation Solitz belonged to. He's sort of a figure cloaked in mystery. Um, he is by all accounts, when people first encountered him out there, he was really well off. Uh, and there were rumors that he might have discovered um, like treasure from a Spanish ship uh, and used that gold to build a fortune. But he was um, the major sort of diplomat between uh, the indigenous nations in the area and the people who were establishing themselves um, from the UK and then the, eventually the US uh, and really sort of helped broker relationships between the First Nations uh, and the incoming people at the time. And so much of the history of the area was really at his discretion with him at the helm there. Um, and not the least of which is the establishment of Washington's first road. So is a, is a single stone enough of a memorial for him? I'm not sure. Um, we're going to take you briefly over one more time because whenever we do the Fern Hill tour, there's uh, tons of questions about this very mysterious looking brick structure on Yakima. Uh, and I want to tell you guys what that is because, and this shouldn't surprise anyone at this point, it is a gift from George Bird. Uh, as, as the streetcar became more and more important to the development of the area, George Bird developed a significant amount of money and infrastructure in the area to have their own 
power substation so that the streetcar could be electrified instead of uh, coal and steam powered. And if I can bring it up here really quick, you can see that building. Uh, it's privately owned right now. Hey, Aries. But you can see it's gorgeous. And to the best of my knowledge, it's not um, under historic protection right now. Even though it is the original George Bird um, power substation. And then for a period of time, it was used to store um, fire wagons and hoses. It became sort of the unofficial uh, firehouse in the area so that they could really develop other places out there. Yeah. Oh, thank you. In case uh, you were joining us a little late, uh, Indian Henry is the the use name that was given to a gentleman named Soholitz. Again, no one really knows which tribe or nation he belonged to, but he was uh, an interpreter, a guide, and sort of the first diplomat in the area. That as the Hudson Bay Company came out, um, as the Bird family was establishing themselves out here, he helped them navigate the terrain and um, sort of relationships with the Nisqually and the Puyallup in the area as well. And I believe the official count was that he spoke six different uh, sort of Salish languages in the area, as well as English and I think Spanish. Like he was, he's a fascinating dude. I would love to just do a tour just about him. So brace yourselves. It's it's coming, coming down soon. <clears throat> um, one other thing that I want to tell you about really quick is, if I can bring up my historic photos of it really quick, uh, I see that Faye was uh, talking about chicken. I know she can't have been referencing uh, my desire not to go through the super dangerous rain cistern down there, uh, but I'm sure she was talking about the Denison family. Uh, the Denison family in the late 1800s settled out there in the Fernhill area, and they were like, you know what? I think there's going to be some good money in chickens. So they put their entire fortune into chickens as, and I kid you not, there was a chicken abundance, like a, it was a chicken crisis. Uh, and so the price of chickens absolutely bottomed out. And the Denisons now had 14,000 chickens. Uh, and Mr. Denison was primarily not a chicken farmer, uh, but he worked uh, retrofitting steam equipment, uh, mostly with locomotives in the Tacoma area. Uh, and so thinking quick on their feet, as the chicken market collapsed, he was like, you know what? I bet you I could make a steamer. And thus he did. Uh, and so the Denison family then created this beauty right here. And in 48 hours, just the two of them, Mr. and Mrs. Denison, uh, slaughtered 14,000 chickens and canned all of them using their brand new homemade steam equipment. Yes. Now, they didn't just stop there. Uh, they became the first chicken cannery uh, west of the Mississippi uh, and developed such an enterprise because uh, the place was being settled by lumberjacks, railroad workers, sailors, homesteaders, people who were hungry, let's say, uh, for a way to store chicken long term. And so this steam canned chicken became very popular in the area. Uh, they then went on to primarily can tamales as well. They had a huge tamale market and developed that into such a vast empire that Nally Valley ends up buying the Denison canned chicken enterprise for a mint uh, and they retire free and clear of anything that they could have ever had to worry about. Now the original Denison home site is still down there, Denison canned chicken, uh, and it looks just like the single family home from that historic photo I showed you, if I can bring it up. Uh, this is pretty much accurate to what it looks like today, uh, except that whole cannery section in the back there has been bulldozed. It's just a concrete footprint now, uh, which is an unofficial skate park for the area, which is pretty, <laughs> pretty interesting. Ooh. And yes, I would love some Fernhill School uh, fight song lyrics. Uh, if you want to put those in the comment, I'm in. 
Um, speaking of which, I had a sweet photo that I wanted to show you guys of that schoolhouse. So this is, um, I believe, the 1888 version of the schoolhouse uh, with the bell on top. The first one, again, was a 21 foot by 21 foot square for the 21 students in attendance, uh, and it didn't have the bell. The 1888 version uh, was expanded, and then in the 1920s, they had to demolish this school uh, and then build a new belfry on the very modern brick structure, which is the one that um, that we see in Fernhill today. So it's not only a source of great civic pride for the people of Fernhill, uh, but it's also a very sort of historic treasure of the area. I think that's those are the the big parts. That I've got to check my notes here, make sure I didn't leave out any of the big parts of Fernhill. I I love how concise Fernhill is too, like the businesses, the history, it's all a very bite-sized walking tour, but it's so pivotal to the story of Washington State with that first road, uh, such an important school being pivotal to the Hop Empire. It's got so much going on for it, and it's, it's, a, it's a cool part of town. I love that Fern Hill, every time they've been pressed to do something they don't like have just stood up and be like nope and it's always fern hill that rises up to take care of it whether it's moving the church whether it's reclaiming the bell whether it's doing a sit-in uh on the the streetcar fern hill doesn't contract out they take care of their own problems and even when you're down there today it's still got that same sort of passion and energy to it the first time i did a fern hill tour down there, there was a, a, a group, a Facebook group of uh, historians called the Mount Tahoma Oldies. Uh, and it's just these guys and gals who um, have a Facebook group where they can revel in the nostalgia of their time. Uh, and they heard that we had done the Fern Hill tour and they missed it. And they were like, oh my gosh, if you do it again, we'll rally together uh, and we'll make it worth your while. So I was like, absolutely, I'll just come down and do this for you. And they got together, they got like one of those old school manila folders. Uh, and right as the tour is about to begin, the sort of leader of the whole thing was like, guys, Chris has been doing this for free. Uh, it would be great if you would generate some support for him. And they just like pass it around and put tips in the folder and definitely made it worth the while out there. So I really appreciated them coming together, which what a fantastic opportunity to remind you that if you've enjoyed your tour, and you'd like to show your appreciation, like the Mount Dome Holdies, we do have a PayPal link on the front page of Pretty Gritty Tours where you can uh, put your money where your mouth is if you want. Tips are always appreciated, never expected. Um, but I want to thank you guys for joining me uh, tonight. Like I said, I love the Fernhill neighborhood, and it's one that always, always gets forgotten by people, and one that I love to show people because it's got cool little pieces to it um, and is still a neighborhood that's fun to visit. If you find yourself on the corner of 84th and Park, uh, explore around. Uh, Tibbetts, Little Jerry's, um, the bookstore is down there, uh, Hoarders, Attic, Antiques. Uh, you get to see the old Oddfellows uh, loot factory. You can walk around the exterior of the George Bird uh, Yakima Power Station down there and the Blueberry, the Yupik Blueberry Park is pretty close down there as well. So there's a plenty, plenty to recommend the area. I hope you get down there and enjoy it. With that, um, I'm going to cut you guys loose tonight. And I will see you hopefully on Wednesday for our upcoming ghost tour. Thank you guys so much. Keep on exploring. <laughs>